So. Dr. Rice Spencer ist uns heute via Zoom zugeschalten. Er hat es jetzt persönlich nicht hierher geschafft. Er selbst promovierte in Meteorologie an der Universität von Wisconsin-Madison, bevor er 2001 Principal Research Scientist an der University of Alabama in Huntsville wurde, war er Senior Scientist für Klimastudien am Marshall Space Flight Center der NASA, wo er und Dr. John Christie die NASA-Medaille für außergewöhnliche wissenschaftliche Leistungen und äh, für ihre Arbeit zur globalen Temperaturüberwachung mit Satelliten erhielten. Dr. Spencer arbeitet weiterhin für die NASA als Leiter des US-Wissenschaftsteams für das Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer auf dem Aquasatelliten der NASA. Er hat mehrmals vor dem Kongress zum Thema globale Erwärmung Stellung genommen. Forschung äh, wird, die, seine Forschung wird vollständig von US-Regierungsstellen unterstützt, zum Beispiel von der NASA, NOAA und DOE. Und wurde noch, nie von Öl, für den wurde noch nie von den Ölgesellschaften um eine Dienstleistung gebeten, nicht einmal von Exxon Mobil. Dr. Spencers erstes populäres Buch über die globale Erwärmung, Climate Confusion, ist jetzt bei Amazon.com und Barnes Noble erhältlich. Das war ihm noch wichtig zu erwähnen. Das war es jetzt erstmal mit der Vorstellung. Dr. Roy Spencer stellt jetzt vor seinen Vortrag, wie extrem entwickelt sich die globale Durchschnittstemperatur. Dr. Roy Spencer, very happy to have you here in our conference, also via Zoom. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon from Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, our recent work on urban heat island effects. I could have talked about climate sensitivity because we have uh, new research published on that subject too, but I wanted to keep it short. And of course, you can ask me any questions at the end of this talk. It's it's a fairly short talk, and uh, and and in fact, the, the very last slide I show, I left in there by accident, uh, which will show um, how much warming there has been in recent decades compared to climate models. And of course, we all know that climate models are the basis for global warming horror stories and, you know, the climate crisis narrative. But mostly what I'm going to talk about is the urban heat island effect. This is based on a paper that we have. Uh, hopefully it will be published soon. It's been conditionally accepted. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and advance to slide number two. Uh, if you're looking at this sec second slide, Basically, what we did was we took all of the global thermometer data in the GHCN data set and looked at uh, urban heat island effects. Uh, of course, that, you know, warming just due to increases in population and all of the things that population brings along with it, pavement, uh, air conditioning, automobiles, buildings, all the things which we know uh, produce spurious warming in thermometer data. And what's interesting is that some of this warming even occurs in rural areas. This plot here on slide number two shows four diff the increase in population density for four different classes of station, that's weather station, population in the United States from 1880 to, I believe, 2022. And you can see that even rural stations in the upper left-hand corner, that's the, the, the first plot, rural stations uh, have increased in their population as well as suburban and urban. I mean, and of course, you know, the U.S. is different from much of Europe. Europe has been heavily populated. Well, not heavily populated, but, you know, well populated for a lot longer than the United States have. So, has. so you know, what the results we get will depend somewhat on, on the region we look at. But what I'm, mostly what I'm going to show you is results from the United States. So if we go to slide three, basically what we did was we took millions of pairs of, of station matchups. That is, um, 
pairs of stations that are close together and compared the difference, the average difference in temperature between these stations to the average difference in population density. Okay. We did this in different years uh, from 1880 up to 2022. We did it in different regions. What I'm going to mostly show is the United States, but I'm also going to show you a map of our computed urban heat island effects across the entire Earth. And then also in different seasons, since um, urban heat island effects are typically stronger in certain seasons, uh, particularly spring and summer, than in fall and winter. Uh, let's go to slide four. So when, when we do the statistics of this, we uh, compute the change, as I said, the change in temperature, the average change in temperature difference between two stations and the average change in temperature difference in, I'm sorry, population density, the diff average difference in population density between stations. And we do this in different classes of population, average population density for those two stations, okay? So the top plot here on slide four shows regression coefficient uh, values of how much the temperature change with population density, that's the vertical axis, versus two station average population density on the horizontal axis. And these results, these regression results typically show a fairly, uh, it, it's it's linear. Notice this is a logarithmic plot in both uh, in both temperature and in population density. Uh, and when you get a linear relationship in in a log log plot, uh, that indicates a power law relationship. So then that's the bottom plot is all you do is you take these regression results for different classes of population and you integrate them. You sum them up from very low population uh, densities to very high population densities. And we get a curve there. The, this is the urban heat island warming uh, as a function of population density uh, that increases rapidly uh, for very low population densities. This is this is not new. This is what Oki, uh, the researcher Oki, O-K-E, -E, uh, demonstrated back in 1973 with data from um, from cities and towns in um, in Canada, Europe, and the United States. He got basically the same kind of relationship. All right, so now let's go to the next slide, slide five. This shows our calculated then, it, it, we, take, we take the previous information I just showed you, increases in population density, and what those translate into in terms of increases in temperature, the urban heat island effect, for these different classes of population. And this shows how much for the United States, how much warming, urban heat island warming, there has been for these different uh, population classes. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that the temperature we're using is the average of the maximum and minimum temperature. These effects are much larger in the minimum temperature, nighttime temperatures, uh, than they are in daytime temperatures for most urban locations. Not always true, but usually true. So this is the average of maximum and minimum temperatures. And so this shows that, you know, the, the, the largest amount of warming since 1880 due to urban heat island is in urban areas, which makes sense, right? And followed by suburban areas. And then the weakest effects are in the rural areas. Now, next slide, slide uh, six, shows what these translate into in terms of you know, how much of the warming that's been observed since 18, well, this is 1895, since 1895 in the United States, how much of the observed warming has been due to the urban heat island effect? And this is what we get. We get for rural stations about 8% of the warming, 
uh, for nearly or semi-rural uh, locations, 42% of the warming, and then about 65% for both suburban and urban stations. So over half of the warming observed at suburban and urban stations since 1895 in the United States is due to the urban heat island effect. Um, this shows some of the results. If we look, instead of at the United States, we look at all of the stations in certain latitude bands, uh, all the stations all around the world, um, sort of grouped into latitude bands and, and calculate all of these same statistics and then apply them to data sets of population density. And this is what you get. On the left side is the calculated urban heat island effect in May of 1850, okay? And then on the right side is the corresponding urban heat island effect in May of 2023. Uh, let's go to the next slide, slide eight. And this shows a global map. This is this is this one is for June of 2023, showing the global distribution of our calculated urban heat island effect um, all around the world at fairly high uh, grid point resolution. And the, the data sets for this I have made available at the website that's listed at the top of the slide. Um, anyway, I'd be glad to entertain any questions about this. The, um, th there's been some recent work on urban heat island effect, as I'm sure a lot of you know, by a variety of people uh, in Europe and elsewhere, O'Neill, the Connollys, Willie Soon, Maurice Croc, uh, Divos, Katada from Japan, and a lot of other people have been looking more carefully now at the, uh, the surface temperature data and finding that even after adjustment for, the, uh, for spurious trends, the, the so-called homogenization adjustments, there are still some serious problems in the data. So we consider what we're doing to be complementary to those efforts. And uh, this is the slide that I accidentally left in from another talk, <laughs> but I'm glad I put it in, I left it in here. This shows surface warming um, from observational data sets. Uh, an average of five observational data sets is the heavy black line, okay? Um, and it's compared to CMIP-6 climate model projections. And of course, as most of you already know, the warming um, in most of these models has been greater than observed. Um, and of course, the models, the only source of warming, I mean, you've heard talks so far today uh, related to other kinds of things that can be causing climate change other than increasing CO2 for instance, solar activity. And I believe that there can be warming and cooling episodes over long periods of time that aren't forced by anything because the climate system is a nonlinear dynamical system. But these models that we're showing here assume all the warming is due to increasing CO2. So to the extent that that, that isn't true, you know, global warming due to increasing CO2 becomes less and less of a problem. And in any event, it's a huge source of uncertainty that the public isn't being told about, that we really don't know how much of recent warming has been due to increasing CO2. There's, there's no way to know for sure. Or even with high confidence, there's no way to know. Uh, so that's the last slide I have to show. And uh, I've only used up 15 minutes. <laughs> I know it's getting late there. And quite honestly, I just put this talk together this morning because I had totally forgotten about this meeting. And uh, I've been very busy with other things, um, particularly um, I'm, I'm sort of taking on the lead role of writing up a response to the, um, the National Climate Assessment and what most of you already know about here in the United States, the uh, EPA's endangerment finding, so that if Donald Trump wins uh, wins the presidency, 
uh, they will be looking to what what we're working on um, for details about how to handle the science arguments of all of this. So anyway, I'd like to uh, go ahead and and address any questions uh, that you might have since uh, we have quite a bit of time left over. 